comes to the Jordan expecting. He's expecting something great to happen in his life. This is not a decision he's made lightly. The one he's considering. And what he wants is a closer relationship with God. What he wants is his life to be in the image of God. That he might be worthy of God in what he does in this world. And so he comes to the Jordan. And he goes to John and asks to be baptized. <coughs> Jesus expects something great to happen. And in this moment, in Mark's story, God says, <coughs> you've done the right thing. You are my son. I adopt you. He says this in Mark primarily to Jesus. In other Gospels, other people will hear this. But in Mark, this is a relationship between Jesus and God. That God talks directly to Jesus. And says, you are my son. You will do what I command in your life. Because you are a faithful servant. You came here. You got baptized. You made the commitment. And you surrendered. And now you're mine. And that relationship will last all the way to the resurrection. Because Jesus came seeking, came expecting. I wonder how many times we come someplace expecting the good. The Spirit of God, though, we, we want to talk about it just a little bit. Terry read to you from Genesis the first time this story of the Spirit of God comes through. It's, it's got, it goes by many, many different names. In the Old Testament, it's ruah, which means breath, the breath of God, like a wind over the waters. What it is is the creative force of God, the creative word. We hear, sometimes we hear it as the word of God. The God speaks and in speaking, creates an idea, a vision, a possibility, something new, something creative, something novel. When God creates, and then it becomes reality. But first it starts as a spirit, as an idea, as a thought, as a word. And then it becomes real. Can you think of anything in your life that didn't start with a thought before it became real? Somewhere it started as a thought. And then became real. Sometimes, though, the thought comes as a surprise, doesn't it? We're not always expecting that thought. And our lives are changed forever. But, you know, people have a way of resisting those thoughts. They kind of hear a new idea and they say, well, that doesn't exist, therefore it's not common sense and won't work because no one's ever done it before or we tried it and it failed. Now, I don't want to pick on anyone individually because every single one of us has done that at one time or another. We've resisted an idea because we don't think it's practical. It won't work. We don't have the resources. It's never worked before. It couldn't possibly ever work again. It's just common sense. Common sense said that people could not fly. Common sense said we can't defeat smallpox or polio. Common sense has told us all kinds of things we can't do until someone listens to God and to the Holy Spirit and makes it happen. We're confronted with these things daily. Now, it's important when a new idea comes up to say, is this a God-born idea? We don't want to just take every new idea and act on it. We need to examine it. But if this were possible, would this be the will of God? Would this live out God's desire for God's people? Can that happen? 
I'm going to share a story with you. And I'm sharing this story with you because, well, it's sort of been what I found myself doing in life. I remember uh, in, a, in a, uh, a Bible study class one time, the, the teacher asked us, who in the Bible would you most like to be? Now, I thought about it, being fairly new to the class and all, and everybody was saying, well, I'd like to be, uh, you know, Isaiah, or I'd like to be John, or I'd like to be Paul, you know, and I'm th- thinking, you guys are nuts. I want to be Caesar. <laughs> he had all the goodies. He had all the power. Well, that was wrong-minded of me. I confess to you. But one of the pers- people in the class said, you know, I don't see you as Caesar. <laughs> I think they all said that, but one said it out loud. It's more like John the Baptist. And I pondered that. And as I look back over my career, I realize I haven't done anything particularly great. But boy, have I been involved in the start of some wonderful, great things. And I want to tell you just one of those stories. Because I know it's one that you can relate to in this congregation. Something that happened here before I came here. It also happened to me. Someone came to me in my office her name was Hillary. She came to me in my office and she said, you know, we've got this parent respite program. We call it Fridays, Fun Fridays with Grandparents. And could we expand that program into a preschool and how much money can the church give for it? And I said, yes, we can expand it. Yeah, you're not going to get a nickel out of the church. <laughs> we didn't have that resource. She says, well, what do we do? She says, start talking to people. If it's a God-born idea, it will happen. But start talking to people. Now, this is the phenomenal part. She started talking to people. And nine months later, nine months We opened that preschool with $130,000 in the bank. That's a God-born idea. That's not my accomplishment. But that's people listening to the Holy Spirit and acting upon it in faith. Ignoring the we can't do it because we don't have the resources. Ignoring that it's not practical. There are other preschools in town. That preschool, I was up there visiting after Christmas, now serves 95 children in the preschool and the after-school program. Now, I tell you that story because you know that story. Those of you who have been around here a while, (coughs) you've lived that story. You know that's a story of faith. Rose started this little parent respite kind of thing going. (coughs) Then someone said, why don't we expand the preschool? And someone said, oh, that's not practical. We don't have the resources, not enough money. Right, Rose? Somebody said that. I know somebody said that. But someone else said, I think God's calling us to do this. I think we should try it. And now we have a premier preschool in our town serving our community. That's listening to the Holy Spirit. That's always talking, always teaching, always guiding, always urging us on. I heard on the, on the uh, NPR this morning coming into the church, I I was listening, and and this wonderful example came up. They were talking about the problem that military people, and this was in the context of the Army, have with dealing with a stressful life. That's stressful already, then add tours of duty and separation from family and and threat of death and, and, and injury constant. And the problems that that brings up, and we've, we've heard about this, is you know, PTSD and depression and, and suicide, and there's been a great deal of concern for that. And one of the therapies that they, have, they employ now that's showing marked improvement in the mental health of military and their family 
is to daily make a list of the good things that happen to you. Daily. Not the bad things. See, good things happen to everybody every day. Good things. Well, there's somebody holding a door open for you. That's one of the examples they use. That's a good thing. Somebody giving you a new idea. That's a good thing. It's the expectation that opens us to the good things in life. That's the expectation. If we expect bad things, that's all we're going to see. But if we expect good things, we see possibilities. The Spirit of God is not just God's Word. It's God's permission. When the Holy Spirit speaks, it is God giving you permission to act on God's behalf, on God's born idea. You get to deliver it into the world. We're right now in the midst of planning some expansion of our ministry, and, it's, and one of them is uh, a clothing program that leadership team has, has been talking about distributing clothing to people who, who need it. And the vision is that it will be free, that it will be quality, clean clothes. And we know there's a need for it. All around this back country, there's a need for it. There are people who are underclothed, don't have winter jackets, don't have shirts without holes in them, don't have clothes to go on a job interview. And we need a trailer to carry this around. Somebody came up with the school bus idea over at um, Descanso. They have an old school bus over there, and they wanted to use that. And, and no, let's get a trailer, because anybody can pull a trailer. Not everybody can drive a bus. And so the idea is rolling along, but you know, we don't have a trailer. But we have an idea, and I believe it's God-born. And I believe there are more God-born ideas Somebody came up with the idea of having a carnival with a Ferris wheel. We can't do that. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We started talking. It was a God-born idea that said we can do big things. We can expand our ministry because God has given us permission. Let's be open. Today we're going to renew our baptism, those of us who are baptized. You'll be invited forward to remember your baptism. Now, how many of you were infant baptized? Remember? (laughs) You do too. You remember that you were baptized. You remember that because somebody in the community of faith told you you've been baptized. And they made a vow to support you in your Christian growth. And you've made that same vow in this room to those that we've baptized. And that's how we remember. We remind each other of our baptism. That's what the community is about, so that that memory doesn't depend on your age. That that memory is lived out every day. That memory that you were once baptized, and the Spirit of God descended upon you and gave you the gift of adoption into God's family. So today as you come forward, I will invite you to remember your baptism and be thankful. Now if for some reason you have never been baptized, please come forward anyway. Just hold your hands like that. And I'll know, and I'll offer you a blessing. Baptism is the recognition of what God has done in us and for us through Jesus Christ. And God works in all of God's creation that we might live the Holy Spirit now and forever.